Hi developers, scalability is an important part when architecting a web application. Cloud providers like Microsoft Azure provide some services that help us to scale the web application and the database. This presentation will work you through the concepts of scale up, scale out, load balancers, traffic manager, CDN, caching, Elasticsearch, microservices, and so on. For scaling the database, we'll be discussing technologies like sharding, partitioning, DDD, NoSQL, and many more. I'm Hossam Delay, Microsoft MVP. Join me in this video to learn how you can scale your web application and your database in order to support thousands or millions of users. Let's imagine we have a business web application hosted on a virtual machine. At first, our website will get 10, 10 requests per second, for example. But after we have launched a new cool product or service, everyone wants to use that service. And so the number of requests uh, will uh, grow up. So the virtual machine will take all that load. And at a certain point, the virtual machine will stack because it has a limit about the requests or the load that it can handle. So when it reaches its limit, the virtual machine will start rejecting the incoming uh, requests. That's a bad news for your business. So what we need to do here is to move to a bigger virtual machine. That's the first option we consider and we call it scale up. So scale up is moving from a smaller virtual machine to a bigger virtual machine. The big, what we mean by bigger virtual machine is more RAM and more CPU. So here we can move from eight gigabyte and eight uh, CPUs virtual machine to a bigger VM that have uh, let's say, for example, 500 uh, gigabyte of RAM and uh, 64 CPU, for example. This is um, an easy option to do because it only requires uh, moving or copying the application from the smaller VM to the bigger one. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't involve uh, changing the source code of the application. If our website is getting more requests coming from our users, then one single VM may not be able to handle all this load. And scale up in this case will reach its limits. Because at the end, one single VM cannot have an unlimited amount of RAM and CPU. So what is instead of having one single VM, what if I can have multiple VMs? Well, this solution is called scale out. So with scale up, we focus on making one single VM bigger. Scale out will try to create multiple VMs. So with multiple VMs, let's say N VM, for example, we'll have N amount of CPU and N amount of RAM per, C per uh, VM. Having multiple VMs instead of one VM means that now we will have multiple IP addresses exposed to our uh, users. So here, if you, an HTTP request is coming from our user, then here it will go to VM1 or VM2 or VM3. Well, we need a mechanism that can handle those requests and can redirect the request to the right server. This technology is called Load Balancer or Traffic Manager. Load Balancer or Traffic Manager will get the HTTP requests from the users and then it will choose to, to redirect that request to VM 1, 2 or 3, for example. And with this, they will ensure that our application will still always running and we can serve more requests. Our servers might still suffer because of the growing number of requests. With a quick analysis of the content of our web application, 
we saw that we do have lots of static content. Videos, images, JavaScript files, HTML, and CSS files too. All those static content is saved on the disk. And we know that the hard disk takes so much time in order to be accessed. This results into the request coming from the user takes so much long time in order to access those resources. CDNs are located in multiple locations called point of presence, POP, around the world. So that it is possible to get one that is closer to the user location than your servers are. The second is accessing the file on the disk. So CDN might use a combination of HDD, SDD, SSD or even RAM to cache this data depending on the frequency of data access frequency. A time to leave TTL can be applied to the cache to say it should expire at a certain time. CDN caches static content files, but what if all we need is to cache some dynamic data? This is can be solved by using cache. When lots of SQL requests to the database gives the same result, then it is better to cache this data in memory to ensure faster data access and reduce the load on the database. The typical case is the top 10 products displayed on the home page for all users. Because it uses RAM memory and not disks, it can save as much data as the RAM do. Data is stored as key value pairs. Cache can be distributed uh, across multiple regions. Azure Redis cache can save up to 530 gigabytes. Azure doesn't provide a service for memcached. But be warned here that in case of an underlying infrastructure is issues, there can be potential data loss. However, Redis cache provides a solution for data persistence while uh, memcached doesn't. When users search for a certain information in our website, a request will hit the server in order to search for that information from the database. Most requests are similar in their form. So why not here caching those requests with their response data? Well, here where Elasticsearch comes to play. Elasticsearch can cache those requests along with their response data. With this way, we don't need to access the database in order to retrieve that request or that data related to the query, but we can retrieve it from a caching system, which is faster than accessing the database. Elasticsearch can also provide a near real-time search as you type suggestions this reduces the load on the database, which itself reduces the load on the server as the request will be processed in less time. Elasticsearch is accessible via REST API and requires changing the app source code to use it. Elasticsearch could also be used for log analytics and real-time application monitoring. Another good practice for scaling web applications is to split the monolithic application in two parts. The first one is the front-end application and the second one is the back-end application that contains the web services. With this splitting, we can host each part on a separate server. This will reduce the amount of load on each server, which will help us to scale the application. One inconvenient for this approach is that we need to uh, change the source code of the application because here we are splitting pa uh, two parts to live into uh, different uh, servers. We did split the monolithic application into front-end and a back-end, but we are still getting a growing number of requests from our users and most of those requests are hitting the uh, back-end uh, side, so the back-end is struggling to to scale. So what if here we can split this backend 
into multiple parts. Well, here where microservices comes to play. If we analyze the backend, we can see that it is composed of multiple modules. We can find modules for authentication, modules for payment, for recommendations, and many more. So the philosophy of microservices is to say why not why we still get all those modules into one application hosted into one server. Why not splitting this monolithic uh, up so that we can have multiple uh, micro applications connected it to each other. And each micro application or mic micro service will be hosted on a different server. Those servers, we call them the containers. With this way, we can not only reduce the load on the monolithic application, but we could also scale each part or each microservice differently or uh, independently from the other microservices. Maybe we are uh, having the microservices responsible for payment is more used than the microservice responsible for uh, identity management. So with this way we can have two containers to handle the payment modules and only one container to uh, get the requests for the authentication. But be careful here that going from monolithic to microservices requires lots of change in the application source code. It's not unusual to be required to rewrite the entire application from scratch. Microsoft Azure supports Docker containers and also container orchestrators like Kubernetes, Service Fabric and Swarm. With microservices, the monolithic application is split into small pieces based on business domains. Can we go deeper more than that to split the application to smaller pieces? Well, serverless apps makes it possible. Ser serverless apps is a small piece of the application on its own instance. This instance is managed for you, so you don't need to take care of any container or VM. It can scale out automatically depending on the load. Typically, you can use it for resizing or processing images, starting a new job on a database, etc. Anything that is more often independent from the business logic. Now that we have multiple tiers running, each one on a different IP address, the client application will ask, where do I need to go? Well, here where API management, also call it API gateway, comes to play. With Traffic Manager, we can distribute the load between different virtual machines. And here with API Management, we can distribute the load between different microservices or API endpoints. API Management can take into account the load on each microservice. Our microservices need to communicate with each other, so they can use REST web services for communication. But some of this communication doesn't need to be run it synchronously. So why still waiting for a response from the server? Well, here queues comes to play. Queues are a good solution for asynchronous operations because with REST Web Services, we need the server to be available and also we need to wait for the server to complete uh, processing the request. With queues, now we don't need the server to be uh, available to process the request, but we can send our request to a queue and that request will wait until the server will be available later to handle it. So we are not bl blocked while waiting for the response from the server. This approach helps to decouple the different parts of the software and makes them easily scalable and resilient. There are some other good practices for scaling web applications that doesn't require using cloud services. From those practices is pushing tasks to the client side. For simple tasks like resizing images, the client can do this processing of the image. So why bothering the server 
with some of those simple uh, tasks. Another good solution to not bother the server is to not send the same HTTP request if we are sure we'll be getting the same response. Well, here caching the HTTP requests into the browser is a good practice. The browser is intelligent enough to, to cache those uh, requests with their responses and also to add a TTL time to leave for each object stored in its cache. So that we can say that the uh, objects are saved in the cache only for three days, for example. More if we go beyond three days, then that information will be either updated or deleted. Until now, we have explained the different options for scaling a web application. But most web applications connect to a database. So when we have a growing number of requests, those requests will also hit the database. Like web apps, the database cannot receive an infinite amount of queries. Not only that, but also the database can have or have a maximum amount of data that it, it can store. Hence, it needs to be scaled. So for the next parts of this video, we'll be discussing the different options for scaling the database. The simplest option to enhance the database response time is to use a built-in feature that is built to do exactly that. Well, here I'm talking about caching data. SQL databases have a built-in feature called the buffer cache, which help to cache the most frequent queries. Caching queries is limited by the size of the available memory. But when we have a big number of queries that does need to go fetch data from our tables, then here we need a better solution to retrieve data from our big tables. Well, here indexing could help. Indexing will help us to not loop the entire table when looking for a certain information from a row. Even with using indexes, we might be below the required response time. This might be because of using non-optimized SQL queries. So we need to analyze our web application and all the uh, SQL queries and that are inside our web app. With a quick analyze of the source code, we find that we, are, we might be using an ORM, Object Relational Mapping, which will generate the SQL queries. And in addition to that, it will try to, for each request, it will try to open the connection to the database, then it closes the connection, which are two additional uh, steps that takes more time. So what if instead of using an ORM, what if we can use storage procedures, which takes less time to uh, query the data from the database? At the end, we can mix storage procedures and ORM into the same application. So we have the simplest queries uses uh, ORM and the most sophisticated queries that takes time, we can optimize those using the storage procedures. If the limits of one single database are reached, then why not creating multiple instances? The duplication can be based on multiple criteria. Well, let's start by the one based on read or read-write operations. SQL queries are either reading or writing data. From here, engineers ask it, why not to write to a database and read from another one? This way, they can reduce the load to a half by balancing it on two databases instead of only one. The read-write database will take the responsibility to update the read database so that they have almost the same exact data. With the web application, when we wanted to go further more than duplicating instances, we split the application into small components. We call it them microservices. 
Can the same logic be applied to a database? Another criterion for replicating database is based on splitting the table itself. This is called partitioning or sharding. Well, let's start by partitioning. Partitioning is also called split vertically. Partitioning divides a table into multiple tables with fewer columns. The customer table that have 20 columns will be split into two or more tables. The first table will have columns from 1 to 7 and the second one will have the columns from 8 to 20. Of course, each table contains the primary key to join data from both tables. This is useful when usually only the first seven columns are needed. So it takes less time to run as it will bring less data. Those two tables could be on the same database or into uh, separate ones. SQL databases support this case by providing features to recognize from which partition to get the data. But be careful here that vertical partitioning should be considered carefully because analyzing data from multiple partitions requires queries that join the tables. That is the case where we need all the 20 columns. We split a table vertically by splitting the columns. Can we split it based on the rows? Well, that is called sharding or split horizontally. Sharding provides or divides a table into multiple tables. Each table then contains the same number of columns but fewer rows. For example, the customer table can be partitioning to five smaller tables, each representing the continent for a group of customers. Knowing the customer location will help to redirect the query to write to the right partition to process less rows. The smaller tables can live in the same SQL instance or in a separate ones, the same as with partitioning. Horizontal and vertical partitioning can be mixed together. But be warned here that um, tables should be partitioning, uh, partitioned so that queries reference as few tables as possible. Otherwise, excessive unions, queries used to merge the tables logically at uh, query time can affect performance. Until now, we have seen splitting tables based on their columns or rows. But can we split tables into a group of tables? Well, that, let's see uh, DDD. DDD also called domain-driven design. So we have split the web app into smaller microservices based on the context or domain. The same thing could be applied to the database using DDD. So that each domain has its own set of tables tables for payment, for another set of tables for commands, and so on. Imagine now that each microservice have its own domain tables living in the same container. But we wanted here that the objective of DDD is not to scale the database, but that is a consequence of its application and if it's not built from the design phase of the project, it will require a huge amount of change to the source code of our app. Still, the SQL databases are not enough for handling all the load. Well, why not trying NoSQL? SQL databases are based on schema and relationships between tables. This is at the heart of its limit to reach infinite scalability. On the other side, NoSQL databases save data as key value pairs, so no need for schema neither for table relationships. For that reason, tables can be split horizontally and infinitely. But be warned here that NoSQL eliminates relationships between tables, so you still can do tweaks to establish relationships, but that is not recommended. So you have better to make the, de the decision if it is still suits your need or not. 
At the end, scaling an application on the cloud is not only the responsibility of the architect, but it also requires the developers to think about the stateless aspect and DBA to think about partitioning the database. This work should be done at first. One important note to think about is also metrics and analytics, because those who can tell if we need to scale up or down and especially what exactly needs to be scaled. So I hope the video was helpful for you and thank you.